Hello and welcome to episode 146 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week we have a new giant king of offshore wind turbines. It's so big the International Space Station had to extend its orbit. The gigantic Consumer Electronics Show has wrapped up in Las Vegas. The highlight of the show for me? Heated seatbelts. No. Yes. But I'm concerned that makes me a very boring person. China might beat its 2030 clean energy targets by five years. I guess that means we'll just have to shut down the podcast early, Brian. Uh, what do you say we take up pickleball? I refuse to play pickleball. Norway and Germany announced plans for a hydrogen pipeline between the two countries. This could be the biggest hydrogen story since the Hindenburg. And also this week, I talk hydroponics. Biking in winter and what a city needs, and it's not what you think. Wood-burning stoves and indoor air pollution. And Chinese cars are here. That is, if you live in the UK or possibly China. All that and more on this week's edition of The Clean Energy Show. Uh, so I just had the radon guys uh, here at my house. Um, I'm trying to get the radon gas situation in yeah. my house taken care of. And we're going to talk a lot about indoor air pollution and air quality on the show today. And this is part of it. It's, you know, what we have to deal with where we live. Radon gas, you can't see it, you can't smell it, but it uh, can cause lung cancer if there's too much of it, you have too much exposure, um, etc. But uh, anyway, it turns out I've got a very complicated house to try and get this done. They actually tried to do it while I was still stuck in transit in Edmonton over the Christmas break. But they needed to talk to me. They needed me to be here because it isn't an easy job because um, it's it's kind of a weird house. And the furnace room is just full of stuff. And I've been adding stuff lately. And this is part of the problem. Like, you know, I put in the heat recovery ventilator a couple of years ago. Yeah. So that takes up some of the sort of the wall space and the exhaust space. So they have to try and exhaust the radon gas from underneath your house. So they they put in a pipe typically like on the sump hole. And they they root that pipe. Do you have pipe. a sump hole? Yes, we do have a sump hole. Oh, okay. But uh, I don't know. There's no place to put this exhaust pipe. Like the whole house is filled up with stuff. It can't go out the back because there's a deck there. Uh, can't go out the driveway because there's already too much stuff there, too much stuff in the way. So, you know, they've got to try and figure out a route um, out of the house without having a visible pipe. Like that might be what we end up with is, you know, like a pipe running through the middle of our living room or something. Oh, um, that's not good. What's that? It's the radon pipe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Stay away from that. Yeah, but so anyway, what they've instructed me to do is uh, look for a radon hotspot. Oh. Uh, they th they think there might be a radon hotspot because it comes up through the floor through different cracks and holes and stuff. Yeah. And if we can identify where there's a particular hotspot and they think there might be one like by the front of the house, then that's where we might put in the exhaust fan. So I'm, I've got instructions now to just move my radon meter. I bought a radon meter off of Amazon. I've had it for a couple of years now, you know. Every couple of days, I just move it to a different location in the house and try and figure out where the radon hotspot is. So a couple and maybe of days of readings is fine then for finding the hotspot? Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Like a, a one-day reading even should do it. I would have thought your house, because it's so big and so sprawling, that you would have lots of options, you know? Like there's wings to your house, Brian. There's different it's wings. 1,500 square feet. It is not a large house. It's a bungalow. But it's, it goes on forever. Yeah, it's a large bungalow, but it's just, it's crowded with stuff. And it's it's also, it's a weird kind of custom designed house. You're coming to us today from your bomb shelter, for gosh sakes. It sense. has a bomb shelter, which was built into it in 1962. There's a drain in the floor in the bomb shelter. So they told me to test by the drain. Oh dear, I've been by uh, that drain. <laughs> yeah, but... You know, maybe that's a place that you put in the pipe is in the is in the bomb shelter, possibly if they if that turns out to be a hot. Spot. Have you done just readings in the bomb shelter for a couple of days before? No, I actually never really tested the bomb shelter. Oh, just one time, you and I were recording in here, so yeah. I had it in here for a while. It seemed to me that it was high. That was a long time ago, but it seemed to I, me it was I high. I don't remember. But yeah, so it's not going to be taken care of immediately. I'm going to spend a few weeks here just uh, moving this radon meter around the house and. Uh, 
uh, looking for hot spots. Well, that's too bad. It's, uh, you know, these guys, this, the radon company, this is all they do, right? This is just yep. what they do. That's all they do is mitigate radon. Yeah, and they're specialists and they know what they're doing, but um, they said this is a particularly tough job. And then, of course, the other problem is the solar panels, because you often, you put a, a vent pipe through the roof, but a lot of my roof is covered with solar panels, so yeah. can't really do that. Damn, solar's causing problems, eh? Well, that's funny. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got back from the dentist. No cavities. Yay. I have to say this, uh, the, the flossing never came up once. First, first time ever, <laughs> it never came up once. Wasn't, yeah. Uh, keep up the flossing, James, or you know, try and increase your flossing, James. That's what the other guy said. So I fired him and got a different dentist. This one's working yeah. out really well. Yeah. No, my dentist has not bugged me about flossing in a long time either. My my wife flosses nightly. If I went over to the bed, you would find floss in the bed, literally all over the place. <laughs> it just falls asleep flossing, and she has all kinds of tooth problems that I don't have. I don't know. It's genetics. Anyway, speaking of uh, her, I bought her a uh, hydroponic um, um, garden for Christmas. Nice. Uh, well, it's, it's not really hydroponics because I did a lot of research on it. It is called the click and grow. So water just sits there. It does not circulate. And this hmm. applies to our show for a number of reasons. One, it's one way to uh, reduce your carbon output is if everyone grew plants at home, which is yeah. hard to do, you know, especially where we live. Uh, be nice in California, maybe, where it's warm all the time. But, you know, these plants, they're growing now in the dead of winter because they've got a little light on top. The hydroponic versions, what do they call them? Oh, darn it. They've got a brand name that I can't remember right now. But you buy them in stores and they have a little light on top and you can get different sizes of them. Well, they have a pump in there. And that pump uses a lot of electricity. And apparently these lights on this kit uses a fraction of the electricity. So it's 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 like four dollars a year or something like that to grow plants. So I didn't want to, you know, you want to save money doing this, right? Ultimately. Yeah. Um, not that that's your main reason. The main reason is to have um, you know, pesticide free, fresh, tastier vegetables that uh I would love to do this. You know, I would love to do this on a large scale. Yeah. Uh, this only has nine pods in it. But and they're growing already. Everything's so, growing. Like, what what are you growing? And we're growing with just the stuff that came with it, which was basil, lettuce, and tom baby tomatoes. So it's only like you know fourteen inches high that you can really grow things. You're growing dwarf versions of these plants. You can extend it up, but I mean you can buy grow lights at Costco and hardware stores now fairly cheap because LED. That's that's sort of changed the game for growing stuff at home is the mm -hmm. the, the LED technology and they have different color temperatures to simulate the different wavelengths of light. So it's exciting. And some people, I mean, you look at YouTube, but there's all kinds of people growing entire walls of lettuce, and mm -hmm. I, I envy them. They've got different things figured out. They've jerry-rigged their own sort of water flow and stuff. So you're saving water too, by the way. So as opposed to your garden where you're, you know, yeah. watering it a lot usually. And you can keep kind of reusing the same water, I guess. Same water, same ponds. And uh, in this case, you don't add fertilizer to the water and the other ones you do. So the ones that circulate, you add fertilizer to the water. And you can make it so the roots grow into the water here, but basically they're just confined to a cup. And yeah, look, click and grow is the, the one I have and I'm trying it out while well, we're trying it out, but we're kind of excited because we've, you know, the watch new vegetables grow in January is kind of unusual where we live, where it's very dark in January. Yeah. And a lot more local food production is what we're kind of looking for, for the future. Yeah. And there's so many opportunities here as one of the things of the, um, you know, the, the era that we live in that excite me the most is this sort of. You know, farming, farming scale level of this, and it, apparently it's 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 pretty tricky to do it cost competitively, mm -hmm. but they're learning, they're learning, they're learning, they're learning over and over again, and they're they've got all these great ways of doing it, and it's great to you know to take use of to make use of geothermal you know, or waste geothermal, even if you're at a geothermal plant and you need to heat a greenhouse in a say a northern climate. Because we, we have to transport, we're up in Canada and we have to transport all our stuff from California or Florida. Wouldn't it be great to grow it here and not have to transport and have the freshness of it and yeah. not have the risk of, say, romaine lettuce having, uh, you know, fecal matter in it from a runoff from the pig farm next door when it rains. And it's raining a lot in California now. <laughs> Hang on tight, everyone who's listens to us in California, because it's, it's horrible what's going on yeah. down there, by the way. 
and it's going to last now, for 10 more days. My other pet peeve about all this stuff is, of course, especially where we live in these kind of suburban houses, large lawns that just typically grow grass. And I think I mentioned this on the show, but there's a local company in town that is doing gardening on people's houses, lots, like on their front lawns and back lawns. That's so cool. So you just let them have the, the property, right? You just let them have the, the yeah. area. And then, you know, you get some of the you get some of the vegetables and stuff. And uh, yeah, we actually contacted them. We tried to get them to use our front lawn, and uh, but they're not doing it in our area, unfortunately. So really? they, they weren't able to do it. But, you know, there's so many opportunities for us to be growing more food locally that we should be doing it. Uh, Brian, last week you had your book report, right? Remember your book yeah. report? Brian's, book, Brian's report? book report. Now, remind us what it was on. Uh, it was on a book called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Okay. And really great a, book. That about was the second money. time we had Brian's book report. Do you remember the first right. one? Uh, that was Ducks, a graphic novel about life in the Albert Oil Sands. Fantastic book. Well, you're not going to believe this. I can't believe you haven't brought this up. Do you know what's happened with that book? No, tell me. Barack Obama put it on his list of number one books to read. <laughs> Wow. You know, he releases uh, his favorite movies and songs and books. Sure. And it becomes like an Oprah thing. Yeah. Well, Mr. Obama did that. So I have another edition of Brian's Book Report for you. Wow. Book report. So, so probably Barack Obama, he probably listens to the show then. You know, honestly, <laughs> he might. <laughs> Hello, Barry. <laughs> Uh, tell your friends. Maybe put us in your list of top podcasts <laughs> yeah, next please. year. That would help us a lot. Totally. Or, um, you know, send us a million dollars, something like that. I don't know. It did make it onto lots of best lists of the year for graphic novels, for sure. It's fantastic. Well, this was on his books, period. So, yeah. Um, the uh, Public Broadcaster in Canada, CBC's Q program, had an interview with the author, even though they just spoke with her. Her name is? Kate Beaton. And this is what she had to say about what she hoped Barry would get out of this. I would ask him um, what he thinks about people's lives in these extractive labor and what can be done to make those situations better when people go out to work in extraction uh, or jobs that take them to isolated places. Mm. They are sort of lost to the rest of society. You know, these, these workplaces, they're little discussed. And if I brought to his attention issues that I care about, like class issues and environment and Indigenous rights and mental health in these workplaces and, and human rights and the power of corporations over people's welfare, mm. then, I, then I'm glad for that. I, 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 would, I wonder what he took from the book. Maybe we should have a book club, an influential book club every year, you know, Brian's uh, yeah. annual book club, and it'll be, uh, everyone will follow it, and uh, authors will get a big Brian Stockton bump, you know. <laughs> well, I might have to start reading more than one book a year then. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a short list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> short, but prestigious. Okay, so yeah, I want to get back to indoor air quality. So there was a really great article here on The Guardian uh, from George Manbiot, he's a Guardian columnist, and the article is called My Burning Shame, I Fitted My House with Three Wood-Burning Stoves, and this reminded me a lot of my story about putting in a gas range, a gas cooktop in our kitchen, because we renovated our kitchen in about 2015, 2016, around there. And I wasn't really thinking about it too much. I don't think I knew about induction cooktops at the time. Obviously, I, you know, I was against burning things, but we put in a gas cooktop in 2015, which I realize now was a terrible mistake. And uh, so George Manbiot's story here in uh, The Guardian is about uh, wood burning stoves. So he made a similar mistake that I did in 2008. He was refitting his house in the UK. This is a, a hundred year old house in the UK that was kind of poorly built, poorly insulated. And in 2008, he was trying to upgrade things and make it better. And he was at the time trying to figure out what the best solution was for heating it. And of course, you know, heat pumps were not really much of a thing back then. Certainly air source heat pumps he was trying to figure out how to heat his home in the greenest way possible. And it kind of came down to either natural gas 
or wood. And at the time, he made the choice to go with wood because he thought that maybe that was the greener, more sustainable um, option of the two choices. So he actually has three of these wood-burning stoves in his house and um, at, at great expense. Why, why does somebody uh, anyway, need three wood-burning stoves in their house? I don't understand. Well, uh, you know, it's probably a large house, I would guess. Okay. Like a sort of a country farmhouse kind of thing, I would think. Maybe with a bomb shelter. I just want to interject, though, uh, something that I read about the whole wave of uh, uh, natural gas um, ovens and stoves is that, you know, how the proliferation of uh, foodie programs on TV, mm -hmm. well, people, mm -hmm. chefs on there would start talking about, and the influencers yeah. would start talking about how natural gas makes your food yeah. better. And it turns yeah. out that's a myth. Yeah. Of course. No. It's just uh, heat, and you can get heat from many sources. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I'd kind of fallen for that a bit, too. Like, I I, I don't do all that much cooking, but it, it was kind of like we were spending quite a bit of money on upgrading the kitchen, and we thought, oh, we'll, we'll make it the best kitchen possible. And at the time, um, that seemed like natural gas. You know, as we're finding out here in this, so there's a couple of other articles I'm going to point to here. Another one on The Guardian from uh, January the 6th, one in eight cases of asthma in U.S. kids caused by gas stove pollution. And I am very close to also replacing this with an induction cooktop. I'm hopefully going to be doing that soon. But you also kind of wonder, so I've got a gas water heater and a gas furnace, which I'm also hoping to get rid of too. But, you know, Part of the problem with gas cooktops is that they just leak sometimes. So, you know, it, it, even if I get rid of the gas cooktop, I might still be getting gassed by my other uh, natural gas uh, appliances here. But I don't know, wood burning stoves are probably worse than gas, um, particularly with like particulate pollution. So George Manbiot here in his story here, he noticed that like you have to open the door to the thing to put wood in and stuff. And he has asthma, and he noticed that every time he did that, it it irritated his asthma. And sure enough, that you know, there's studies about this that, uh, yeah, indoor air pollution from from gas cooktops and from wood burning stoves. This is all bad. It's you know an interesting thing, particularly with the UK that he brings up in the article. It's mostly uh, wealthy people that burn wood for heat. Is it's that something right? where. Yeah, yeah, it's it's become an affectation of the rich in a way. <laughs> and, you know, he says, if this was something that, you know, lower class people were doing, it probably would have been banned ages ago. Uh, but because it's mostly, you know, um, kind of wealthier people doing it, uh, and not that many, you know, it sort of depends on where you live, but, um, you know, there's not that many people using wood for heat, but they tend to be of a higher income and, uh, you know, out in the country, but it's it's not good. None of this is good. Yeah, out in the country, when you have a wood source, I would imagine would be you know the argument for it, uh, and that's you know sometimes wealthier people have acreages. Uh, I yeah. remember when I first had a swimming pool twenty years ago, there were wood burning pool heaters, and they they didn't heat you know nearly as well as natural gas. It took mm -hmm. you, know, you had to put a lot of. It's only good really for. If you're in a warmer climate and you just need a little bit of heat, but yeah, those existed. I kind of wanted one. I don't know why. <laughs> I didn't have any trees in my backyard to cut down. So, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know anyone with a natural gas stove or oven. I would see it referenced on TV and think, wow, yeah. well, who has that? It was not that common around here. I certainly didn't grow up with that. Which is maybe a bit weird because this is very much fossil fuel country and, and we certainly use it for lots of other things. Um, but anyway, there was an also a nice thread here from Michael Thomas on Twitter. So he's a, a, a writer who's written for The Atlantic. Um, he does a blog about climate issues and stuff. And uh, he put a great thread here on Twitter recently about these same issues. Gas stoves responsible, 12% of childhood asthma cases. And uh, he goes on through his own personal story of he got a monitor. So I have a radon monitor. Turns out you can get consumer level monitors that can measure other pollutants as well. He, you know, he did the same thing and was measuring the noxious gases, uh, the NO2 levels, uh, nitrogen dioxide particularly is the problem. And uh, he has a, a gas range in his house. And uh, e every time they were cooking in the evening, sky high levels of uh, nitrogen dioxide and you know it 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 all graphs out through an app and everything 
you know, he could tell like which nights they had ordered takeout by just looking at the graph, right? Like these, these levels, if you're not using your cooktop, um, the levels are, are way lower. So I don't think I'm going to get another thing because I think I'm just going to get rid of my gas appliances anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, it would be an interesting study. It's another thing you can do to check your own uh, indoor air quality. And it's one of those things that's not really regulated much, you know, like there aren't really laws about indoor air pollution. There's laws about corporations mm -hmm. polluting uh, the air, but, you know, inside your house, it's really, uh, it's, you're on your own there. Like you'd think that, especially around here, you'd think that maybe landlords would have a, a, a law that, okay, if you're a you know, landlord, you got to test for radon in your properties. It's, uh, you know, we all know it's super bad and it's very common around here, but there's no law forcing anybody to do anything about it. But yeah, it, 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 and Michael Thomas here on Twitter, he points out that, you know, these studies have been going actually on for a long time, that basically for 30 years, we've known that gas stoves cause asthma and other respiratory illnesses. We've basically known this for 30 years. Nobody's done anything about it. And of course, there's been more of a proliferation because of, you know, the, the gas lobby and, you know, hiring influencers to put more of this stuff in our homes because, you know, we've all kind of bought into that. Maybe it's better. Yeah. Well, I haven't bought into it. I always thought it was weird, man. I always thought, why would you want an open flame to cook with? I mean, we're we going back to the caveman days. I mean, I, yeah. I, never, I never got that. I never understood why that was OK. Yeah. I mean. You know, it, my brother-in-law is a chef and chefs do often prefer gas because the heat is instant. So, you know, there are reasons to like it and use it. When's um, the last time you was at your house? Mm, a couple of years. You think you'll be around when you get an induction and you can try it out and let him try it out if he is not used to it? Yeah, we could make a special episode. <laughs> the chef and the induction cooktop. How does it go? Maybe a... Some sort of sauce he could cook. Well, in many ways, like it's great. Induction's good for things like melting chocolate. Like it's always difficult to get the right temperature for melting chocolate without burning it. Mm. That's a thing that induction is perfect for. So I imagine there's, in terms of a chef, probably negatives and pluses for each. Well, I just melt my chocolate in the microwave um, and then I put it into little bunny molds at Easter, you know, very, <laughs> very delicious. Don't recommend it, not healthy. All right. We have. I think I'm going to come up with a regular segment called "What James Found on YouTube." I don't know. I'm thinking about it. It's in the it's in the research and development era uh, in the uh, wing of our lab here. And I think you may have already started that segment. Well, I don't have an intro for it, so I mean, but <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a theme. It's kind of a regular thing. Well, this week I was watching a one year old video uh, from the Not Just Bikes channel. This is a a fellow um, Canadian person from London, Ontario, who um, was talking about Ulu, Finland. And Ulu, Finland has a very successful winter biking uh, strategy that is effective. That everyone, it's like 85% of the people rides a bike in Finland, in this, in this town. And they compare it to other cities in Finland, and they're not as good because of what they do here. So what do they do here that makes it different than everyone else? Well, they basically have a lot of bike paths that don't interact with traffic at all. They'll build underpasses, you know, so the bikes can go under the road so there's no interaction. And they keep them clear, which I'll talk more about in a second, but I wanted to play a little clip from the video. In cities with cold winters, there is almost no correlation between winter temperatures and the amount of winter cycling. This is based on research. So there's been a lot of people who, who research this stuff because it's a... Uh, an issue going forward in the world where we want to clean up the world and, and what would we be able to do like that? Now, I, I can't see that happening in the city where we live. Uh, it's a very much a car city and it would cost a crap load of money to do that. And they're just not yeah. going to do it when it gets down, when it can get down to minus 40. And, you know, not to call out uh, Finland, but we're probably colder than Finland, right? We are, Brian. But here's yeah. an interesting stat. It does get down below minus 20 there. Celsius, which is minus four Fahrenheit, and there's only a 15% drop in ridership. Now, I call you to the picture that I've put in our script here. Look at that picture below here. That is yeah. a school. That is a typical school in the wintertime. Uh, you can't even see it all because it's just a freeze frame, but there are hundreds of bicycles. All the kids are taking their bicycles to school in yeah. the wintertime. I just blows my mind. It just because I would have loved to. Die. I remember the first day of spring where it occurred to me when I was a kid. Oh, you know, the snow is gone. I can take my bike. I wouldn't have to yeah. walk 20 minutes of grueling walking. I can get there in five minutes and 
and have a you know a great time doing it. I remember that feeling. And it would never happen the day that I should have happened. I always realized yeah. it a couple of days late. I either, either saw somebody or it just occurred to me. Uh, I always remember the feeling of putting on running shoes in the summer for the first time yeah. when you realize it's spring, the snow is melted, and you can put your running shoes on and go outside. Best feeling. So yeah, the snow clearing in Olu is done very well. And in fact, uh, it's done within three hours of two centimeters of snow. Can you imagine? It certainly doesn't happen around here. And it's plowed multiple times a day if necessary. So this is expensive and it is complicated, but they say, the studies have shown that it is a fraction of the cost of maintaining the streets for cars. And I can't even imagine the health benefits. Like, Oh yeah. People say that when you cycle in the wintertime that you're actually warmer than you think once you get going. I don't know how much is true in e-bikes if you're uh, taking it easy, mm -hmm. but <laughs> and they would have the same problems that electric cars have. They would have less range and so on. But yeah, I just thought it was interesting that it can be done because it this town has the same, the city has the same population density as London, Ontario, the place where the guy's from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's an even comparison there. And there's just, you know, which is probably similar to ours, actually, where we live as well. So I don't Yeah, know. well, back when I had a job, I used to walk to work all winter, even if it was literally minus 40. And I did always kind of enjoy that with a nice park and everything. Doing it on a bike always seemed like an extra step I was just not willing to do. And of course, our you know, our roads and paths and sidewalks are just very it's badly hard cleared enough in the to winter. drive in an SUV sometimes. It's hard <laughs> enough to drive, but, you know, I, you can certainly walk to work when it's minus 40. Yeah, and some people have. I, my neighbor used to walk quite a ways home from work in the wintertime. Just, she's a, a bit older than me and she's doing well. It, it's, it was better than driving because, you know, especially in the gas car days, you know, having to warm up the car and, you know, it, our problem here is like you, you do a five, 10 minute trip off and somewhere you go into a store for five minutes and then you come out and you're your car is dead cold again. So, uh, you know, often I, walking is the way better choice. Also interesting from the video, I noticed that none of the kids are locking their bikes. They just put them up and leave them. Yeah. Because well, everybody, back, else, everybody has a bike. They don't need one. <laughs> yeah. Back in the 90s, I was traveling through Europe and I did some video segments for a, a TV show here on CBC called Utopia Cafe. And one of the segments was about bikes in the Netherlands. And, it, you know, it was just... I, I just, it was wild. I just couldn't believe it. You, nobody locked up their bikes and, and they were everywhere. And, but of course, if they're everywhere and nobody locks them up, then, you know, the chances of yours getting stolen is infinitesimally small. So, uh, Electrics, Seth Win Weinthrob was at CES as well. And he noted that there's now 20 more DC fast charging manufacturers than there were last year. So this is really taking off. It's going to explode wow. due to the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, going, there's a lot of companies that are going to jump on this and and possibly do well, I would think. So these companies are trying to make affordable products for businesses to provide charging. So if you have a restaurant, maybe you have a DC fast charger, like not, a, mm -hmm. not just a, like a level two charger, but a level three, a low level three where it's not, you know, $200,000, yeah. but they're still pretty expensive. He says. So his favorite is um, a FreeWire brand that includes a huge 160 kilowatt battery. That's the size of, a, you know, the longer range electric trucks, I would think. And it only requires a 240 volts uh, electrical service. So and it can backfeed as well during uh, super peaks. So if you want to feed the grid, it can do that uh, and make money for you. If you've got a program set up to do that, up to 150 kilowatts. And he says, if you're a store or a restaurant uh, that gets one of these fast chargers for its patrons, uh, but also you come away with a full 160 kilowatt hour, 150 kilowatt backup for your facility if the grid goes down. So that's nice. You can stay open. Your mm -hmm. cash registers work. Your lights work. Your induction cooktops perhaps work uh, with little relative cost or, you know, um, you don't have to run something that's not 240 and have to upgrade its grid connection to 480 volt three phase, which is very expensive. So you can use your existing wiring, which is cool. Yeah. Well, if you're visiting a restaurant for a meal, you're going to be there for an hour and a half, maybe two hours even. Um, so you don't need necessarily the fastest charging, but it would need to be faster than just normal level two that you have at your house. We've been talking since the beginning of the podcast, almost three years ago, of Chinese-made cars coming here to North America, mm -hmm. to the Western yeah. world. And to my shock and, and amazement, uh, over 100,000 Chinese manufactured new cars entered the United Kingdom roads last year for the first time. And that is 7% of the 1.6 million total 
new cars purchased. And this is from Schmidt Automotive Research. Well, they're already here. I had no idea. It's like uh, Korea was the last one yeah. and now China's coming. Yeah. I mean, they're not here, so I hadn't noticed, but um, yeah, that's that's surprising. Like everyone else, they're going to California. Well, not California yet so much, but Europe. You know, Europe is, has a big need for, because of their, you know, government policy. So a lot of the Chinese made uh, new energy vehicles, as they call them, either hybrid or plug-in hybrid or, well, um, electric, which is what is taking off the most, is happening. So speaking of CES, you have a CES story here. Yeah. So uh, this is from Green Car Reports. It's important to note this is actually not in any cars yet, but I thought it was relevant because we were talking about these kinds of issues. Last week, you had the shocking revelation that if you're stuck in a blizzard somewhere and you're in an electric car, you can run the heated seats. What, 31 days? Is that what it was? 31 days, yes. And, that, and by the way, be... our TikTok video was at 113,000 oh, on, yeah. on, on that on that topic. I'm going to go look at it, what it is now, because uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious, but keep going. And it, it, would that have been on like a full charge of the battery, 31 yeah, yeah, days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for an electric car. And by the way, Brian, just to, to clarify, that's without considering whatever the computer is taking up. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, assuming that the computer somehow didn't take up any, oh, 156,000. <laughs> I, TikTok, I bet yeah. people are arguing <laughs> when they get that oh, high, yeah. people start getting mad and arguing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How it's not possible. And then suddenly there's a hydrogen thing. discussion going on. And if you're from TikTok, and chances are some of you 156,000 people are, hello. Yeah, Welcome hello. to our uh, Clean Energy Podcast. We like to have fun here and yet talk about positive stories and uh, the, uh, you know, addressing of climate change with clean transportation and clean power. Yeah. Very popular so, in uh, Macedonia. Number one last week. <laughs> we we were number one in Macedonia in the news commentary. Uh, so if anyone is actually listening yeah, in Macedonia. Yeah, we're still pleading to people in Macedonia to please contact us. <laughs> let us, is this real? Just raise your hand. Do something. Because we can't understand why we're popular in Macedonia. <laughs> so... Well, it's it's more like why aren't we that popular in well, every that's country? The biggest that's question. Really why aren't we number one everywhere? Why isn't yeah. Joe Rogan number two, Brian? Uh, this company at CEF is ZF, which would be ZF for our American listeners, and they are an automotive supplier. And they just figured out heated seat belts, and it's trickier than you might think because this is still a safety feature of the car. So. You know, you, you can't just uh, Why? Throw, throw some Why? 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 Yeah, <laughs> this was not a problem that needed solving. No, but if, you know, we talked about last week about how great it is to have those heated seats. They oh, can last so this sort of heats your days. front end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your this left is... nipple will get a little bit of warmth there. <laughs> and Yeah. But, you know, and that'll make you feel more comfortable. I get it. Okay. Maybe you could get a three-point harness, harness and then you could heat both of your nipples. For your race cars, yes. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So they're still kind of looking for takers on this. So nobody has um, agreed to put this in a car. But yeah, they had to figure out this, the safety aspect of it because the seatbelt still has to work like a safety feature. But, you know, this seems like a it's a more efficient way to heat the car. We've already discussed heating the seats is more efficient. Um, Toyota, the new BZ4X, the new Toyota electric car, it has some kind of a radiant heating thing around your feet. Do you oh, remember that's that? a good idea. Yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Because, you that know, was... I would almost get by, because you remember, if you're new to the show, yeah, hello, TikTokers, uh, <laughs> I've got an electric car, an old one, a 10-year-old one, and it's uh, the heater's gone in it. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be costly to replace. I'll do it sometime, probably. But, and so I've been going around in a very cold climate <laughs> with frost on my windows, inside and out. <laughs> Uh, but I've been fairly comfortable because I've got a heated steering wheel and a heated seats, mm -hmm. and it's not bad. It's not as bad as you would think. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, it's, there's no wind in there really, and uh, yeah. yeah. So, the, but I was thinking, my when I'm picking up my daughter from high school, I, my feet get a little cold while I'm waiting. If she takes a while, yeah, that would be perfect. Like I actually thought about, you know, could you can buy like a heated seat that goes on top of your seat? I bought one for like twenty bucks on clearance once yeah. at a. Bed Bath & Beyond, for some reason, had them in a bin for Christmas. 
Yeah. And you plug that into your cigarette lighter or your 12-volt plug, as they are called now, kids. And, yeah, you used to light cigarettes with those things. <laughs> and you throw that down to the floor and uh, yeah. it would help. And I might I might yeah. still do that. I might replace the little fan I bought for my window, which is doing very little, mm -hmm. and just put, a, put one of those down there. No, and Toyota has something like that. You know, everyone was making fun of their first electric car, the BZ4X, first of all, terrible name. But I think that was the one bright spot in it. It had some kind of radiant heating thing for your legs or feet um, that isn't just heating the cabin. So all of these things, it's more efficient way to heat. And if you had a heated seat belt that went across your chest and around your waist, as well as a heated seat, then you would have to use less to heat the whole cabin, which is less efficient. And yeah, it would just be more comfortable. And hell, they should do that in a gas car. Like even, you know, it's a good idea. It's like, why not? Yeah. Because why not? Heated floor. I love that idea. You know how we talk about giant wind turbines here on the show? We've been talking a lot about the new records in offshore wind turbines because offshore wind turbine turbines are getting huge. Yeah. Huge, oh, taller, <laughs> touchy the sky, touching outer space. They're just big things, bigger than the Eiffel Tower and bigger than a lot of things, those wind sweep on these things. And the reason why they do that is because there's more airflow up there. The higher you go, there's more airflow. Uh, plus, if you can put in a one giant turbine, it's like less money than putting in a bunch of little ones. Yeah. Today's modern offshore wind turbines are replacing like 14 or 15 of the, some of the earlier ones from 20 years ago. And yeah. that's just less less cost to, to put in one big one than, than a bunch of small ones. Well, this is happening, to my great interest, onshore as well. A Chinese uh, wind power company has rolled out a new record for offshore wind. This is a prototype that has a diameter of 260 meters that makes it the largest and most powerful wind turbine in the world. We're talking about a 16 megawatt one last week or a couple of weeks ago. This one's 18. And that was a prototype, but it takes a couple of years to go from prototype to first install, as we've learned from the 16 and 14 ones before that. So this is 18 megawatts. One of these wind turbines will power 40,000 homes. Now, another interesting fact about these bigger turbines offshore is that 13% less turbines are needed for wind farms. Like, say you want a, a one gigawatt uh, wind turbine farm to, yeah. you know, give you what, a say, a, a nuclear reactor would give you. Well, you would need 13% less turbines with these new bigger ones compared to the ones that are going out now, which are 14 mostly. Some of the bigger ones are 14. So that's... That saves you money, and that brings down the power of wind. But, like I said, onshore wind turbines are getting bigger too. Less fun because, you know, you see them more than the offshore ones, which can be tucked away uh, off the coast so they're not quite visible. But anyway, construction of England's tallest onshore wind turbine is to begin this February, next month. The turbine will be located in Bristol and will reach 150 meters. That is approximately 492 feet, just short of 500 feet into the sky. And that is double the height of the average English turbine right now on shore. It is going to be 4.2 megawatts. And remember, we just talked about an 18 megawatt offshore one, which is typical. And this one will power 3,000 homes, which is still amazing. You know, like one turbine will power 3,000 homes. It's just incredible. Taller turbines can access faster winds uh, since the wind speed increases with altitude. So I don't know, there's diminishing returns. And like we've said before in the show, you really can't build turbines infinitely big because you have to carry them down a road and things have to turn around corners. And it's just, I don't know, unless they find a way to make the blades you know, like Lego or something. Yeah, so 18 megawatts now is the record. How, how much bigger do you think it might go? Oh, God. You know, whenever somebody makes a prediction like this in the clean energy space, they're always really wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> just like me <laughs> predicting stocks. <laughs> um, I would say uh, they're going to get bigger. They're going to get more efficient. They're going to, um, the modeling, the computer modeling is going to be better. So they're going to output, I'm going to say, 24. Yeah. Something like that. Something but I, like I'm that. not an expert. I'm just I'm just guessing. But I would, you know, literally, like, at some point, airplanes will have to, you know, completely avoid these uh, wind farms if they're big. Uh, so yeah. I'm sure, you know, turbines are also getting taller. 
The U.S. Uh, Energy Department, Department of Energy, estimates that their average height has increased 66% since 1998. Okay, so I've got a story here from Hydrogen Insight, which is a website I've been reading for a while now to try and kind of figure out what's going on in the hydrogen world. And uh, Norway and Germany are planning to build a hydrogen pipeline between the two countries by 2030. Now, we're hoping to do the podcast until 2030, so we can hopefully keep an eye on this story and see if it actually happens or not. But yeah, they're planning to send hydrogen, you know, back and forth from Norway to Germany. I, I'm not sure if this is a good idea. You know, <laughs> hydrogen, you know, we're, we're moving through this era of fossil fuel pipelines, which we all know can uh, leak and catch on fire and all kinds of bad things. So, you know, I don't know if this is a good idea well, or not. Well, they have been but... talking about putting natural gas pipelines to use for hydrogen. They said that it was doable, although I have heard some pushback on that, but that's what the natural gas industry will tell you is that hydrogen can go back and forth on natural gas pipelines that already exist. And of course, there's kind of two main kinds of hydrogen right now, blue hydrogen, which is derived from fossil fuels, which is not particularly clean, and then green hydrogen, which is made from 100% renewable energy sources and should be a, um, you know, a clean source. So they're going to start with blue hydrogen with the hope that they could eventually get up to green hydrogen as both countries' um, grids get uh, kind of cleaner. You know, it's part of all of the shakeup in, uh, you know, Germany seems quite interested in hydrogen. Um, they're, of course, trying to get off Russian uh, oil and gas. So, yeah, we'll see if this uh, actually happens. Brian, I've got a list of vehicles for apartment dwellers. I am constantly revisiting this. Electric vehicles in winter, because there's a lot more models of electric vehicles. And uh, last week I said that the Nissan Leaf was the only one that heats its battery when it's not plugged in. Now, we're talking about very cold climates here. Having said that, Denver and places throughout much of the north half of the United States, continental United States, had very cold weather. And you kind of want your car to work in the worst case scenario. You kind of don't want to be stranded. That's what people sort of go for. And they would be very inconvenienced if it was very cold one day and their car didn't work. Well, the, the cars generally work, but they don't work well unless the battery's heated. The Nissan Leaf heats its battery automatically and if it's below minus 17 or one degree Fahrenheit. And the reason is just to make it functional, you know, because the cars may turn on, but they may not, you know, let you drive. They might say, you know, propulsion is reduced, uh, which I've seen in very cold weather, just with like 40 degrees below zero. It's just uh, certain instances when the battery gets low, it doesn't want to go too fast, says, it, you know, you can't really accelerate quickly anymore. So, yeah, I've, I went through lists of different vehicles, but I didn't go through the Toyota BZ4X because, BZ4X, because, you know, I'll be really impressed if they heat their battery. My thinking is apartment dwellers, okay? Do you live in an apartment? and you park on the street, can you buy an EV? That's my question. If you live in a cold climate, a climate that gets cold. And none of them do. Like the, the Ford F-150 Lightning it only uh, heats the battery when it's plugged in or when you start it. Uh, now, most of these vehicles you could start via app or via remote. And, you know, once you start it, you can warm it up for 40 minutes and that'll warm the battery. It takes longer to warm the battery than it does to warm up a combustion engine. Um, is you're not dealing with friction, you're just dealing with uh, fluid that's running through the battery that gets heated up in most cases, except for the Leaf. Yeah, if you live somewhere cold, the Nissan Leaf is a good car. Now, Tesla doesn't either, but to offset that, they, there's a lot more superchargers if you live in an apartment. And you can't charge it. It's a lot easier to go to find a supercharger and charge up once a week or something like that, or twice a week. You know, just so you can have electricity. The Ionic 5, I, I just took something from their manual here for you. Uh, during cold weather, DC charging may not be available to prevent high voltage battery degradation. So they may not let you charge at high speed at all so that it doesn't hurt the battery. There, there's so many things in these cars nowadays to prevent the battery. The batteries could charge faster, but they're not letting you so you don't hurt your battery. That's one reason why the batteries last longer than people expect. So if the vehicle is remotely started that has been parked in cold weather for a long time, the operation of remote start parking function may be delayed or canceled depending on vehicle condition. That's not good. High voltage battery warmer system, the uh, high voltage battery warmer system 
uh, prevents reduction of battery output when battery temperature is low. So you can start your car, hopefully, and get it running. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, I'm a little concerned by this. Yeah, just that if you don't have a driveway and you don't have a way to plug in your car, you do have to do a little bit of extra research if you're looking at uh, buying an EV. I don't know why people aren't following Nissan's guide here. You know, like why, yeah. why I, I assume they were and they're not. Like you should be able to heat your car. You should be able to keep your, because it's not using, the batteries are much bigger, by the way, than what the Nissan Leaf was, right? Mm -hmm. Nissan Leafs started with 24 kilowatt hour batteries. They're now, you know, 80, 100 more. Why not use a little bit of that to keep the battery warm so that you can park on the street so that you're never stranded? Because, uh, yeah, we don't want that. I, I would suggest probably they've done the research and maybe going down to minus 40 doesn't <laughs> harm the battery in the long run. Like, that's why I assumed that Nissan did. It's like, okay, well, we don't want to harm well, the they, battery. Well, they say in the manual it's to make it functional. And I and honestly, I think it wouldn't function because it barely functions at minus 40. Like, if, if you drive around and get the battery too cold, uh, it will... Um, you know, go down in temperature, you can see it on your app if you have a um, Leaf Spy app. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes, you know, it's a functionality. Like they say that lithium batteries, at least the chemistry that Nissan was using, maybe there's new chemistries, I don't know. But it seems strange to me. I mean, people, I, I'm just suspicious that people aren't making these for cold climates because that's what we found happen all too often um, with people. Um, but they do generally work fine, and most people don't have the climate that Brian and I have. So here's another quote from the manual. If the charging connector is connected, the warmer system automatically operates. This is true for all cars. If it's plugged in, even if it's 110, like a normal household outlet, you may not gain a lot of range overnight, but it'll heat the battery. I mean, if it's mm -hmm. extremely cold, you won't gain a lot of range. You know, or half as much as range as you normally would have has to heat the battery. And I just watched a review today, the straight pipes yeah. on YouTube, friends of the show. They just reviewed the Polestar 2, which small. is an EV. I'm surprised how small it was. I thought it was a big car. It's not. Yeah, the interior seemed a bit cramped, but they made comments about that too. If the car's not plugged in, they couldn't figure out how to pre-warm it with the app. And it may be just some fault that they haven't fixed yet or... Um, but, you know, if the car was plugged in, they could pre-warm it with the app. If it was not plugged in, they couldn't. That's concerning. So a lot of times with these cars, if you just preheat the cabin, okay, you're in an apartment, you're James, you live in an apartment, you're expecting to go somewhere, that's fine. You can preheat, you can even program your car to maybe even turn on, we'll see, it's on some cars, but other cars you probably have to open up an app on your phone and start it up. You would do that 40 minutes before departure, but it was very cold out for sure, maybe 20 or 30 if it was less cold. Uh, if you had a surprise place that you had to go, I mean, it would still take you 10, 12 minutes to put on your winter clothes and get out of there, but it would do something for the battery. So when you turn it on, you heat the car. As you're heating the car, you're also heating the battery because it's turning the car on and it will... On, on all these cars, it seems to do that. So if you're heating the car or air conditioning it for that matter, if it's very hot out, it will cool the battery. So it will just condition the battery to have it at the, a good temperature. But generally speaking, you know, electric cars work. And my only recommendation for somebody who lives in an apartment is the Nissan Leaf. And if you're in a very cold climate, because it will heat itself. It's time for the Tweet of the Week, Brian. I've got another one here from Fred Lambert, the uh, editor at Electric. He's got a chart up, a Tesla deliveries chart, which is interesting. He says, this is not only a Tesla chart that matters. It's not the only Tesla chart that matters, but it does matter a lot. To me, it matters more than anything else. Putting more cars on the road that can be powered by clean energy. And what this shows is what they did last year almost equals everything they did before that. You know, it, it, it's incredible. And that's important because what we want is lots of electric cars replacing gas cars and the use going down rapidly. And that seems to be happening. Yeah, the absolute output numbers matter a lot because that's one more purchaser that is not purchasing a gas car if they have an electric option available. So, yeah, 1.3 million cars in 2022. That was what Tesla delivered. Yeah. And, you know, when they started in 2012, it was 2,600. In 2017, it was 100,000. And, you know, a couple of years ago, it was half a million. So all that added up only adds up to a little more than what they did all of last year. So that's great to see. Yeah. They're trying to grow at 50% per year and more or less doing it. It's kind of remarkable. And it's time for 
The lightning round is where we do a fast-paced look of the week in clean energy and climate news to end the show. Uh, it's always sad to end the show, but we have to do it eventually, Brian. Otherwise, we would die from starvation and possibly kidney failure. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance has released its energy storage cost outlook. I know that didn't make any sense to you. I could tell on your face. I agree. It didn't make any sense. But, you know, it's a thinker. Uh, they found costs of stationary batteries have increased as much as 27% last year. When we talk about uh, stationary battery storage, we talk about storing batteries either in the home a business, or more often on the grid, um, where it's important. And by the way, Tesla power packs, they're big packs, they're sold for two years. Not surprised. Yeah. They, they, like I said, they could probably triple their capacity. And by the time, you know, they got it up and running, they would have buyers because there's just an infinite uh, need for that right now. Yeah, they're growing as fast as they possibly can. So it has increased stationary storage, has increased 27% in 2022 because of all the supply. The costs. Uh, the costs have increased 27%, which is not good because we've been expecting them to drop. So uh, it was dropping 7 to 8% a year, 7 to 8% a year before 2021. And this assumes what their, their chart that they've published shows 30% less than 2021 by the time you get to 2030. But if even in all out, it still works out to 7 8% a year, even with the cost increases. But I don't believe them. I think that it's going to, because uh, they, they've got only small, It's they're constantly never courageous enough to do what the history is. They always say, well, history can't keep repeating itself, even though it's worked for 10 years. Well, I think mm -hmm. it is. It's going battery costs are going to go way down. Uh, there's a person I follow on Twitter and on Substack, Hannah Ritchie. I've mentioned before, she's a statistician and publishes articles to do with these kinds of clean energy topics. And she had a great one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a typical electric car that we buy now, if it had come out in 1991, it would have cost a, roughly a million dollars. Oh, <laughs> That's how much battery costs have dropped. They've dropped 98% since 1991. Now we have a momentary spike here because of supply chain issues, because of problems and in- And demand. Uh, Just demand is, and, is taken and off and demand. too, right? Yeah. So we hope and expect that cost curve for batteries to, to keep on the way down. But I thought that was an amazing kind of uh, eye opener. Literally, it would have cost a million dollars to buy a typical electric car in 1990. That's too pricey for me. From the South China Morning Post, China is accelerating its wind and solar power installations in a new five year plan. They have a new five year plan and it is accelerating their previous goals. This progress may allow China to meet its 2030 target for renewable energy installation five years. Ahead of schedule, five years, China is really uh, doing this. And a lot of the reasons are they need electricity and it's cheap and fast. The number of charging ports in the United States increased more in 2022 than in the preceding three years combined with a about, let's see here, 54,000 level two uh, and 10,000 level three chargers. That's the fast charging added in 2022, so 10,000 more of those. That is also accelerating like everything else. That's great. CS Fast Fact, a clean energy show fast fact. How big is Amazon rainforest, Brian? Well, it's almost as big as the contiguous United States. It's seven eighths wow. the size. Can you imagine? Do you know how long it takes to drive across the United States? It's a wow. big freaking place. Uh, and it's only slightly larger than the Amazon forest, which is incredible. Uh, the Amazon has 2.7 million square miles or 7 million kilometers squared. And the United States, very little rainforest within the United States. There were more than 100 days without coal in Great Britain's electricity generation last year, uh, which is not as many days without coal as in 2020 during the shutdowns. But in terms of renewables, in 2022, there were 48 days with more than 50% of electricity generated from uh, renewable sources. Yeah, the UK never had a particularly clean grid, and uh, but it's getting cleaner every day. This is big. From Bloomberg, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission will move to regulate gas stoves as new research links them to childhood asthma, which is something I think I heard uh, earlier on the show. Did I not? I think 
I, Bloomberg was listening and then uh, posted that just now. <laughs> Drought is forcing the shutdown of, yeah, we are very influential on this show, are we not? Br it's Mr. Amazing. Obama's listening First to Obama, us. now this? Drought is forcing the shutdown of the hydro plant responsible for 70% of Zimbabwe's electricity. Drought. That's not That's good. That's not good. You know, it's... And, the UK is on track for 50% of new cars to be electric by 2027 and almost 100% on track. If you look at the graphs, by 2030. So they have, you know, legislation, but, you know, the trend is beating the legislation, which is what we expect to happen in a lot of places in the world. We started this show in 2020, have plans to end it in 2030, and it's because so much of this stuff is going to happen by then. We have to have fireworks when we finish the show. I don't care. It has to be a yeah. big party and fireworks. And uh, all of our listeners from around the world come together. And then we start another podcast. That is... Something to do with geriatrics, because it'll be very old by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, the Ram fully electric pickup truck was uh, sort of debuted at CES, I guess. And it's called um, the Ram Rev EV, and it's due next year. And it uses, interestingly, 800 volt charging, which means like the hand, eh, it will charge quickly, which is something that I like to see. But that is our time for this week, Brian. I mean, gosh, we can't go on forever. We like to hear from you. Please contact us right now. Pick up a pen, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. That's our email address. And we're all over the internet, including TikTok and YouTube, Clean Energy Pod. And you can leave us a online voicemail if you're really nice. Speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. Thanks again to all of our people who have donated to the show. And if you're new, like you're from TikTok, remember subscribe in whatever podcast app you're using so that you can get new episodes delivered to you every week. Brian, I can't wait to do it all over again one week from now. We'll see you next week. <laughs>